The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. <laughs> I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. Welcome to the uh, call today, Dan. Thanks so much for agreeing to do this. Um, for everyone who is listening, we've got Dan Sams on the line today. And I've known Dan now for, I guess, just over a year, like really well. And then yeah. I guess you and I had talked before that. And I, I don't even remember that yeah. conversation, but but you sure did. Um, yeah. So before we get into the fun stuff about being bivocational, Tell everyone a little bit about how you came to faith, and then we'll talk a little bit about what you're doing with the house church movement, and then we'll move into the bivocational stuff. Uh, sure. The The interesting thing, I, I have what many would call a boring testimony until I get into ministry. <laughs> um, I, uh, I grew up in a church family. My parents loved the Lord. I know that's the whole classic story, and when everybody starts with, you know, my parents love the Lord. But my parents really did. I hear a lot of people that say, yeah, I grew up in a Christian home. And then I would dig into it. And I'm like, oh, man, oh, your parents weren't living in a home, were they? Um, I got to see the benefit of my parents love each other. They love Jesus. And they were the same at church as they were at home. And so I really saw what it meant to follow Jesus modeled in front of me. Uh, when there was a need, it was laid before the Lord and we prayed for it. And so I came to Christ at a really young age. Uh, it was like, five years old. I was in a Christian school kindergarten, had heard the gospel before, and there it just kind of clicked for me. And some people are like, whatever, you can't really get saved that young. But I really did start following Jesus. And I didn't have like some big crash and burn, fall away, you know, or anything like that. Like I grew in the Lord over time, you know, it's, you have your struggles and things like that. But Lord was with me. And um, I attribute a lot of it to saying like, hey, Follow Jesus in front of your kids, mm. uh, and and it it works. <laughs> um, and so I I was really blessed to to see Jesus w- lived at home, and uh, so I have have a lot of pain in ministry that God has used to sanctify me and has given me trials for that. But um, I'm blessed to have really gotten to know Jesus at a young age, and I'm still walking with Him. That's awesome, and and that's very similar to myself. I mean, my father was a pastor. And I got saved when I was five. And I look back on that today because I've got a six-year-old. And I'm like, how much did I actually understand when I was five? But because I look at my six-year-old and I'm like, dude, I I don't think he understands yet, you know, most of this stuff. However, I totally remember having that conversion experience. I mean, that's the one thing that I, I totally remember about coming to faith. I was literally listening to my mom share the gospel with my older sister who was eight years old at the time. I'm listening through our heater vents, which is how we used to like talk back and forth between our rooms. And after, you know, my mom went through the whole thing. I went bursting into her room crying and just like, was like, I I want that. I want that. And I look back on that now and I'm like, dude, what did I really understand? I don't even know that my son would understand, you know? But it's it's the interesting thing when you're saved that young, because I understand what you're saying about it, it was real for you. It was real for me. I just uh, mm-hmm. it it does kind of boggle the mind all at the same time. Yeah, man. When I, I kind of jump back on a whole thing of how how much do any of us understand when we first come to Jesus? Anyway? That's true. Like I, my, my depth of understanding on what it means to follow Jesus continues to grow. And my mind is kind of blown every now and then. Where I'm like, whoa bigger than I even realized. Yeah. But, um, man, good it's call. faith of a must faith of a child, a grain, you know, mustard seed faith. You're, you're good to go. Right. And he builds on that, man. So that's, that's a good yeah. call. Yeah. Well, Hey, tell us a little bit about your house church movement. Uh, yeah. So, uh, really interesting story. I had been a part of a pretty large church here in the Cleveland area and some good things. There, there were, good church, uh, definitely had a good experience, but I was noticing that like a lot of mega churches, 
we were attracting churched people. They would have their, you know, people who had kind of grown up in church, had fallen away, and then they start having kids, and they're like, oh, yeah, I want to raise my kids in church. And so when they're like 35, they start showing up. And um, it's fine. I was glad there was a place for that. But I was noticing we were not effectively reaching unchurched people. And uh, I was watching other people kind of grow to a certain level in discipleship and then just kind of become a part of the machine and never really grow and weren't really being sanctified. And after a couple of years, they'd fall away. And I'm like, man, this this just can't be it. And uh, so long story how I found myself kind of being pushed out of that church. Um, lots of things that went on that I can't share publicly, <laughs> but it was just a tough spot. And I'm like, man, I, I don't think I'm, I'm for this anymore. So I thought I was going to be going to the big show. And I had some really cool opportunities for some really big churches and big name churches. And God just kept saying no to all of those and uh, closed the door for me on that. And put me into church planting, and the church planting group I was a part of, which is Christian and Missionary Alliance, they actually just encouraged me, hey, read the book of Acts, spend some time in prayer, don't do anything for a while, just see where God leads. And uh, I was looking at the book of Acts and seeing what God was doing in houses in the first century, and then hearing what was going on in uh, in Iran and Vietnam, and I kind of said, how about we do house church, and um, have since then been in this place of just trying to do what we can to make it as first century style as possible. And so uh, what we do is we focus on discipleship, we make disciples, and then we see the church planting as kind of a byproduct of that discipleship. And so we're constantly training up house church leaders and discipling individuals and just turning them loose to do the same thing. And the idea, we're kind of stealing a little bit from Francis Chan, but we try to plant out with like seven people. Mm. And over the course of a year, we try to grow that to about 14. And in the process, we have, we'll have two house church pastors, ideally, who will each train up a secondary house church pastor. Um, so you can think of it as like if, if there are seven adults and two of them starting off are leaders in the church, and then two more have to become leaders by the end of the year it kind of creates this ongoing multiplication model and um, we're seeing good things. So we're, we're doing that, keeping it very, very simple. Um, it's, we get together, we pray, we do acts two kind of things and God moves and we, we tell everybody it's, it's like a family get together. And so we meet each other's needs like family. We pray for each other like family. We challenge and disciple each other like family. And then once a month, all the house churches come together for a big thing and that's uh, freeing up a lot, man. It's allowing uh, allowing us to not have to pay for a building, which frees up funds. And so now we're supporting a house church in El Salvador that's mm. made up primarily of deported ex-gang members. And they're doing the same thing and allows us to duplicate what we're doing. Uh, it's pretty cool, man. I, I'm probably not doing it justice here, but we're liking it. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the bivocational part of things. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I know this about you. Were, when you were at that church before, were you full-time ministry or were you bivocational as well back then? I I was full-time, man. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So tell I, was, us, I was in the show. <laughs> I was in the big game. Tell us, how, how was that transition going from being in the uh, the show, so to speak, to being bivocational? Was that like a... Oh man, I got to do this. Uh, you know, this isn't what I want. I mean, you know, tell everyone about that because there a, a lot of people go through that. I mean, that's a big deal to a lot of people. Yeah, well, and I'd been on the other end where I'm like, oh, if I could just be in full time ministry, right? Um, and I would say pros and cons, but in my setting, and I'm not saying it's like this at every church. Uh, I realized that ministry actually had to become a side hobby anyway. I tell people. I was really bivocational then and actually just had less time for ministry because I was a creative guy. So I would get pulled into the kind of production meetings. Um, I would, it was all logistics and programming and, and literally like planning the weekend show. And I remember sitting in a meeting and like, man, I, when am I going to disciple my leaders? Like, when am I going to have time? And I realized like I had to sacrifice some of my family to do that even then. And um, so definitely the transition was difficult in that I no longer had a steady, faithful, reliable income, but I'm freed up more than ever now to spend time not only with my family, but also in discipleship. 
uh, because it's not running a machine. It's making disciples. And that's definitely is hard at times because it's stressful. And there are times where I'm like, man, if this could just be the only thing I do, it would be really great. Um, but uh, I, I take stock of my time and my life and my ministry. And I'm like, man, I am, I'm doing more in actual discipleship ministry than ever before in my life. I have more time. And that's pretty doggone cool. Yeah. Uh, plus I have, I don't have a cap on how much money I can make. I don't have to have a year in review where I talk to somebody about, uh, you know, how my performance is and whether or not they're going to pay me more and whether or not they feel like raising that budget more, or they're going to put that to the building. I get to be like, Oh, we need more money. I probably should just land a couple more clients, <laughs> you know? Um, so I also, I'd, I'd have to do the math, but it, we're making more right now. Um, actually a pretty decent amount more. So I'm, I'm liking that too. <laughs> well, and, and that brings up a good point because for your bivocational income, whatever you want to call it, um, you are self-employed. So you haven't, or at least right now you're not working for another company. You've got your own thing going. Why don't you tell everyone mm-hmm. about what you're doing for your bivocational income? So the the big thing I'm doing is uh, marketing, and uh, so I mean this a lot of the stuff, uh, the training that I did with uh, with you guys with the Bibo, uh, it was before it was called Bibo Inner Circle, uh, but yeah, I can kind of tell the story even how I got into that. I've done yeah. some websites. I knew I had um <clears throat> I knew I had some communication skills, and somebody came to me and said, Hey, would you make our website? And I was like, Well, I don't really do websites, and they're like. We don't care. Everybody just keeps running off with our money and we trust you and you have a good eye. So would you just do it? And so they paid me to figure it out. And that led to me making more websites, which made me start thinking like, hey, websites don't pay me monthly money. I need monthly money. And so I started doing some like marketing management, like managing Facebook accounts and all that kind of stuff, which uh, crossed me over into somewhere in there. I did a website for Pete. I'm sorry, for Peyton. And uh, he's like, what can I do to pay you back? And I'm like, can I have a half hour of Pete? <laughs> and um, I got on the phone with you and, and you were like, yeah, you know, there's this training that I took that was amazing. I wonder if there's ever a way to teach some guys that. And um, so that got me into it. This is the Reader's Digest version. Um, but really learned this whole marketing system that that you were teaching. And it changed the game for my business. Uh, I think I was making a few hundred dollars extra a month on the side here and there at the time. And it turned it into uh, a big moneymaker. It's a huge part of my budget. I have other revenue streams now, but I mean, this is the big chunk. Um, yeah. As that answering the question, I'm kind of talking about how I get money from it. I'm not talking about what I do. Well, I'm happy to jump into let's, that too. Let's jump into a little bit of that because I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to lead you. I, I would rather people hear directly from you what you've experienced, the good, the bad, the ugly, the great, whatever. Um, so yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about, cause you said something that's really, really key. And that is when you were doing websites, one of the problems with that, and I'm just going to say this because I've done websites as well, and it, it's just a problem in business. When you do a business where you provide a, a short-term service, uh, develop a website, whatever, once you're paid for it, you're now out of clients, right? Or, or mm-hmm. you, you have to go out there and get another client in order to get more money in. Because the money has now stopped coming in. You're, you're done. You were paid to do a task. You did it. And the problem is, is mm-hmm. while you're doing it, you can't be out there getting other clients. And so you yep. mentioned, um, you know, that was one of the problems. And now it's different for you. How is it different for you today as opposed to being that guy that's just, you know, doing a, a, a service, a one-time service, and you're done? So uh, a couple of things. One is because the the agreement – I have with my clients involve an annual agreement. It's usually an annual agreement uh, with some kind of a monthly fee and then some type of a commission. Uh, it means then I can budget my life a little bit. I can plan for a reasonable amount of money that's going to come in every month. And sure, just like in any business, you deal with clients who, you know, have this issue or that issue and you, but, but for the most part, you can create a nice, 
monthly amount that people have coming in. And so then, yeah, I don't have to keep going out and hassling clients um, or hassling prospects to try to get clients. And then the other nice thing is my clients like what I do. Normally, they're pretty amazed early on when we kind of present the plan of what we can do. You know, we've thought through stuff they didn't know was possible, or we've shown them things that they knew were good principles, but had never had an idea of how to execute. And we just show them how to do it. And uh, that gets really exciting to them. And so then that leads to more business. So uh, it's funny, they talk about plumbers who have leaky pipes. I'm I'm not the same because I still have a funnel set up that's driving in business, but I don't have to market myself that much because my clients are doing so much to promote me. And that's pretty cool. Uh, so we have that going on. Uh, but then effectively what I do is I get on the phone once a week or twice a month, depending on what the agreement with the client is. And we talk them through what they need to do to move the ball down the field for that week or that two weeks. And then their job is to execute it. And then we get back on the phone with them again in another week or two. And we talk about the next step. And so, so much of what I'm doing really is consulting. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a whole lot of time. Um, yeah. And actually, the big thing that I struggle with is I, I, I tell people this. I still think in a lower class, uh, lower middle class work ethic. And I actually have a tendency to work too hard. I have to stop myself and say, wait, what am, why am I doing this? I don't need to do this. The client's not needing this right now. I just somehow felt the need to work. And so I'm, I'm having to reteach that it's not about the amount of time and effort. It's about my knowledge right. that I'm bringing to the table. And that's coming along. Right. So you, you went through what we call now, we call it the platinum Bivo inner circle training, which is basically training, uh, teaching people how to become a, a business growth consultant. How, how hard was it? Would you say your, your transition from what you were doing to adding this piece to what you were doing to this is now, like you said, it's become the bulk of your income. Tell, tell us about that transition. Uh, well, that's interesting. It, it, it wasn't a, um, it wasn't a hard transition in certain ways because so much of it was a change in the mindset that I had. It, it wasn't just about learning a lot of new material, although I did that. Uh, it was, it was a paradigm shift for me where I just saw the world differently. Um, it, and so that, that happened in, I probably in one of the trainings, it was maybe the second training or whatever, where things just clicked and I realized Oh, anything's possible here. Now, now I know how to make money. And so that, that kind of happened in a moment, right? And so then from there, it was a matter of me having the confidence knowing, Hey, if I get into trouble, Pete is there, <laughs> right? Like I can always say, Pete, what should I do here? And, uh, so then it just led to me just kind of walking with confidence into sales meetings and reaching out to people saying, let me just tell you what I can do for you. Mm. And uh, so I think that it went from a paradigm shift to a huge confidence boost. And that confidence boost allowed me to land some clientele early on. And uh, then, then a lot of it was kind of greasing the gears while the engine was running. You know, where I was learning and I would go and say like, Pete, what should I do for this client? And you would say, try this. And then I'd be like, how do I do that? And you're like, ah, oh, it's somewhere in here in the material. And you would show me where and we would roll with it. And um, that's, that's kind of turned out we're about a year into it. And that confidence has brought me into some experience because you definitely have times where like, I don't know what to do. And but there's this community, not just you, but the, the people that we're talking to that kind of help with that. And then now that knowledge has become a little bit more tacit. Now that we're right at a year in, I think, maybe a little bit more than a year, um, it's, it's become something that's a little bit more natural. I don't have to ask for everything every time. Right. Uh, and when I do, it's usually a reminder where you're like, hey, yeah, you remember this? I'm like, yes, I know to do that. What's wrong? Um, and so, yeah. Well, one of the goals that, that I had when I was starting the training is, you know, I looked at my own family experience growing up, my father being the pastor of a very small church, you know, between 50 to 150, probably at the height of the church and the amount of hours that he worked, 
like Saturdays were his prep day and we never saw him on Saturdays. And Sunday, of course, he'd get up before we got up. He'd go to church. He'd do everything there at church. And then when he finally came home, because he had to close down the building and all that stuff, he would just be out, right? So we'd do lunch and then he's Mm -hmm. out because he's tired. And then he's got to get ready for church that night. So his day off was Monday. Well, we're in school on Monday. So Mm -hmm. I, and I don't want to say that I had a bad childhood or anything because I didn't. It was a great childhood. But I didn't realize how much my dad wasn't around. Not, and I don't mean that in a negative way, you know, like, yo, know, dad wasn't around. Not like that, but just like he wasn't around for hanging out on Saturdays. And, you know, we did do stuff every once in a while, Sunday afternoons, absolutely. And we took family trips every summer and all that. I, I don't want to give the impression here that I had a negative childhood because I didn't. But when I had kids of my own, it was like, okay, I want to be there more. And yep. one of my personal goals when I, I did the whole course was I was like, if I could show these pastors how to earn a decent income while they're being a pastor at their church, it's going to allow them to not steal time with, from their family. And that was my, my concern. So one of the things that you mentioned earlier that I kind of want to circle back around to, how much time – do you spend per client, would you say, on average a week? Oh, that's, that's actually a little bit difficult to estimate because I have a different arrangement with different clients. Sure. Uh, I do have, uh, I have one client that is in an industry that I'm really interested in, and so I spend more time with them because I want to, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think, um, I, I, think but, I know which one that is. <laughs> yeah, um, but I would say that... Um, but the amount of time you need to spend is, is probably about two hours a week per client. Okay. But that's that's on the ones – I shouldn't say need to. That's maybe in the early stages where I'm figuring stuff out because normally there's a big uh, onboarding process where I'm – putting together their plan, rolling things out. Right. Um, and I am still a little cautious cause I'm still learning things. And so I'm, I'm probably at a place where I'm, I'm maybe spending about uh, one and a half. Um, but once that client is up and running and good, I can usually get by with about an hour a week per client. Okay. Um, and it, 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 it really, it depends on so many things because sometimes we'll be running a series of campaigns and I'm spending a little bit of time, uh, helping them put those together where I'm doing a little extra or we're, we're judging this or that. But I think when I'm at my best, I'm, a, I'm at maybe an hour and a half a week per client. So what would you say to someone who is like, okay, you know what? I'm hearing what Dan's doing. He's doing this consulting thing. He's doing a lot of marketing, business growth consulting. I don't have any experience in that. I'm thinking about doing this and obviously, you know, I would encourage you of course to take a look at at our Platinum Bivo Inner Circle. But what would you say would be like who would who would this not be for? Who would you look at and go, "Look, I don't think this type of person is going to do well at this." Cuz I have my own personal views on that, but I'd love to hear your yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah, well, and then I got to say it in a nice way though. <laughs> um I would say that for somebody it's not for is if, if you are not able to present yourself professionally in a meeting. Um, and, it, and honestly, if somebody doesn't know the answer to that, then that means it's not for them. Right. Uh, but you know, that feeling where you can, you can sit down and you can speak intelligently about something you, you may or may not be wearing a suit, but you would at least know how to put one on and sit down and, and have posture and confidence in a meeting. I think that is probably the common denominator for all of them. Uh, if you can do that, you can probably do this. I would say beyond that, uh, because I think so much comes out of that ability, just your ability to be aware and be present in a meeting and speak professionally. I really think it all comes back to that because I think out of that is where you – uh, your ability to think through whether or not a particular type of campaign will work or whether or not uh, the logic behind the action item at the end of that campaign is the right thing. 
that all comes from that same place in a person's abilities. Mm. And I would say that most pastors, most church planting pastors especially, have that little bit of a, of a flair. Um, the only guys, and this may be another, the only guys that are church planters that I would say this also wouldn't be good for um, are the ones who they're church planting because they can't work with anybody else. Mm. And I think we've all seen these guys where they, they, they can't work together with somebody. They, they can't execute on a team. And so they feel like they want to be in ministry. And so they plant churches, which is the last thing we want them to do. But those same guys that, of course, they're usually bad at church planting also, those are also the guys that would be bad at this, I would say. Um, but plenty of good stuff. I think most semi-professional pastors could jump in and do this. That's awesome. So let me ask you another really kind of uh, on the spot question, if you will. Sure. Looking back on your time, having you know gone through the program, been actively doing this for clients, what if you had it to do over again? What would you do differently? What do you look at and go? You know what? This is what I should have done instead of that. So I went for what I perceived to be low hanging fruit. And I should have stepped up and reached out for bigger clients earlier. Mm. So what I did was I worked my network. Um, so I'm, I live in a, um, uh, about a town over from Cleveland. We're not really a suburb of Cleveland, but it would look like it to an outsider. And we're in just uh, people around me don't run those same kind of businesses. I wish I had scheduled a bunch of meetings at BNI groups in the major city near me and gone to those and try to fish out of that pot. Mm. Instead, I was so in a hurry to just get some kind of money in. And I was too nice uh, that I allowed two different types of people to come to me. One uh, is people that just weren't hungry to grow. Um, and then I would sign them on and I made money off of them and it was fine, but I didn't get the commissions I could have gotten. It didn't give me the feathers in my cap that I couldn't, could have gotten for my business. And then the other thing is people heard what I was doing that could not afford me at all. And I gave away too much where I would try to help them out. I spent a lot of time helping out guys thinking like, well, you know, this is, this is good and it'll help the kingdom and, and maybe it'll lead to some leads. Well, it didn't lead to a lot of leads and it didn't make me very much money. And then it was time spent that I should have been spending gaining the clients that could really afford me. And so I think that's where I went what I perceived to be the easy route to try to get certain clients fast. And it wasn't that it was bad, but it wasn't as good as if I'd gone to some of these networking groups and really buckled down for a few weeks and built some connections in, and really fished out of the ponds where the big fish were. Wow. I think is maybe the right way to say it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you say that because I think that's what happens to a lot of people, especially pastors, right? Because as a pastor, You've got people in your congregation, however you want to term it. I don't, I don't know that you would call yeah. your church a congregation when you got seven of you in your living room, but you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. they yeah. come to you with a problem. And as a pastor, of course you want to help them. You want to reach yeah. out to them. You want to talk to them. You want to do whatever you can. And when people hear, like the, I tell everyone this, when people hear what you do and they're in business, you will not have a shortage of people who say, I need your help. The problem is just because they need your help doesn't mean you should be spending your time helping them because it may mm -hmm. not be a good use of your time. But that's really hard for a pastor to get their head around because they're so yeah. used to that mindset of I need to help everyone. You do in some areas of your life, but in business – I like to tell everyone, you've got to be ruthless and be like, look, no, this is for my family. This is why I do this, to take care of my family. And that means, you know, if you're just getting started, that's great. I encourage you, go for it, rah, rah, rah. But if you can't pay my fee, I need to go and spend my time with someone else. Otherwise, I'm stealing from my family again. And that's really tough for pastors to get their head around. You know what, though? I'm getting better at it because I can put a quantitative number. And, and actually, just exactly what you're talking about, I had this conversation with a guy I'd known from church, uh, and he had some clients that he wanted me to market for him and wanted just a complete commission base. 
And as he's describing this thing to me, I'm like, well, it sounds great. And the, the payoff could be good, but you don't have anybody making money right now. This is a one big thing you're trying to sell. And so I had that same conversation. I said, you know, you know I'm, I'm already have commission deals. I need to make money this month. And if I'm going to pull time away from make, gaining more clients or working with the clients that are making me money, that time is actually going to have to turn into money this month. And so I, I try to be just really clear and really kind and say, like, I still have to pay my bills this month. And that might sound great as a great commission in the end, but I, you've got to jump into my system rather than me adapt to yours. Right. And people understand that. Right. Uh, when, and, and if they don't, honestly, they're not the kind of people we want to work with. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I'm getting bolder because I'm looking at the budget of what I need to make per month. And when somebody's like, oh, let's try this or do this, I'm like, no, no, no. This is what I do. This is what you need to pay me. And if that's not going to work, it's okay. It just means I'm not the guy for you. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing that I always try to remind everyone. It's, you don't have to be a jerk about it. In fact, usually that's how, usually how I, I communicate to people who I know I don't want to work with. I'm like, well, just so you know, this is what it costs. And if you're okay with that, then we can enter a conversation, but I'm just going to let you know up front. That's what it is. Cause I know most of the time those people are not going to do it, right? They're going to look at that yeah. and go, nah, I can't do it. Now I don't have to waste my time with them. And I also don't have to be a jerk about it, you know, but yeah. at the same time, if someone in ministry comes to me and says, Hey, I need help with this over here. Usually what I do is, and this is, you know, something for you. Um, I will just be like, Hey, look, I'd be happy to give you some advice and I would try and fit them into maybe one of my mastermind groups or something like that. Uh-huh. where I'm not spending one-on-one time with them, or maybe I give them Voxer access to me, uh, uh-huh. but I put it back on them. I'm not working for them. It's just advice only, and I it, it has to work into my schedule. And I'll do that with certain people in ministry where it's like, I see what they got. I want to help them. But here's the whole thing that people need to understand who are going in business. You know, They look at what they're doing, and they go, we've got the greatest idea in the world And of course, in their minds, this could be worth millions. And here's the thing. Everybody who goes into business believes they have a good idea and believes it could be worth Mm -hmm. millions. You have to have that. If you don't believe that, why are you going into that business? However, statistically Uh speaking, it's something like 95% of all businesses close within five years. Well, those people still believed that, believe they had a great idea, believe, you know, everything but it doesn't always work out that way. So I just I just tell them, hey, look, I know it's a great idea. I think it's really good. I think you need to go for it. If you want to work with me, here's what it costs. And I just leave it like yep. that and just kind of walk away. That's another reason why I'm trying to avoid startups more than oh, ever yeah. now. Um, because if they're not sitting on a pile of cash, then, I mean, it's one thing if they've got a whole bunch of money and then I'm like, sure, give me money. Uh, but the, a lot of times they're starting at zero. They don't have to communicate to, they don't have, uh, they don't have a, a profile of what their client looks like because they don't have anybody that's bought from them yet. And then they know they need marketing. And so they want to bring it. And it's always like, we'll give you a piece of the business. We'll do what and it's, it's like, no, I can't do that. I need somebody that's going to pay me right now. Right. And ev- everybody wins on that when we do yep. it that way. Yep. All right, so last final question for you. Um, if there is a, a pastor who's thinking that this is what they want to do, what's your what's your best advice for them? Do it. <laughs> um, the uh, it, It's a great thing. I, I've made a pretty decent amount of money on this. Um, and I'm actually coming into a season where I'm getting ready to ramp up again um, and add on a couple of more clients and, and do a renewed push. I, it, it's so worth it. Um, and I don't know, Pete, I don't know if I've told you this, but when we first signed up and I'm like, man, this is a big chunk of money for me to do this, right? For me, it was huge. And so my thinking was, I'm going to pay the down payment. I'm going to do the first couple of weeks. And if I can't turn around enough money to clear this, then I'm going to call Pete and ask like, Hey, can you just let me out of this? Right? So I was hungry and I, I, probably wouldn't have gotten out of it anyway. (laughs) Not that you're not gracious, but I'm like, I know that I needed to just get into this. And so, um, man, I jumped in 
And I think I did the math. I think I paid for the course six times over within 60 days. Wow. Uh, which is just crazy. Right. And that, that was really, really great. And so I remember thinking like, ah, oh, is this going to be worth it? It was absolutely worth it. It continues to be worth it, not just for the money it's making me, but for ministry. It's getting in, getting me into a whole different circle of influencers. I'm brought to the table on more things. I'm respected in a different way. And um, that's a pretty cool thing because I've come to the table before as a pastor and businessmen just look at pastors a little different. They have some respect, but they're like, oh, yeah, but you don't play in my ball field. Mm. You don't know how it is out here. And I get to say, like, no, 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 I know exactly how it is. In fact, I know better than you, and you need to do this <laughs> for your business over here. And I, I get to be seen as a person of influence at a different party than I used to get brought to, which has brought me way more evangelism opportunities. It's incredible. So I, I say do it. Um, awesome. Definitely do it. Well, fantastic, Dan. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, everyone, thanks for listening in. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. Church